find your ultimate fulfillment, hear me, you will find your ultimate fulfillment, your relational longings will ultimately be fulfilled in, your, in a union with Jesus Christ, the chosen one of God. It will ultimately be fulfilled in this union with Jesus Christ, the chosen one of God. That is such a significant truth because if that truth is internalized, believed, received, someone like my wife won't fall into despair when she realizes that her husband is not perfect, when she believes and receives that truth. Also, if a single person receives and believes that truth, they don't need to wait for a spouse for them to be able to experience fulfillment, relational fulfillment, because that is found in Jesus Christ. That is such a significant core truth. Another, as a segue into the other transformative value in deeply formed life is interior examination. Uh, Jerry is also part of the launch team, and she is actually gonna model that through her story. Interior examination simply is about not skimming the surface of your life so that you're actually digging deep to see what God is in doing, what God is doing on the inside. Would you give it up for Jerry? Thank you. Well, that's a tough act to follow, Jimmy. But, uh, okay. Well, my name is Jerry. Hi. And I'm sharing my story. I'm hoping to encourage anyone who's walking through a season of grief that if we are in Christ, there is always hope and there's always resurrection after loss and death. I just want you to know I'm a crier, so um, tears might flow. Uh, several years ago, I was introduced to Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course through a, through a small group in a church I was attending. At the time, I was living what would be considered a good Christian life. I was counseling and I was teaching and focused on the mental and emotional health of others, even though I was ignoring my own. So the course resonated with me, and, and especially this segment on grief and loss. And I went on to use it um, very often when I was working with clients who were going through a difficult time. I didn't realize then that I was about to embark on my own, my own long season of grief and begin the dig beneath the surface of my good Christian life. In 2012, when Superstorm Sandy hit the New York area, my husband and I were living in a, in a two-family house with my parents. We were on the ground floor, and when the storm hit, our entire apartment was flooded, and we lost everything. All our furniture, our clothing, our books. We had, I had floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, and all the books were gone. All our photographs. Everything we had shopped for and worked for and everything we collected, it was, it was just laying outside in the street in a big saturated heap waiting to be taken away to the garbage dump. But it wasn't only our physical uh, stuff that we lost. It was, it was also our way of life. We had lived with our parents, and we enjoyed spending time with them. Um, we had planted gardens together and shared meals together and worked on the house together and and now we had to go our, our separate ways. They moved to a small apartment in Freeport, and um, my husband and I, we moved to a studio in Queens. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, I remember my father saying, life as we know it will never be the same, and it never was. I felt overcome with sadness. I couldn't see my family. I had no way of getting back and forth, and for a while I couldn't even go to work. I had no clothes or shoes or... I didn't even have a hairbrush to fix my hair. Thank God for the Salvation Army because they would come by every once in a while and I could pick out clothes that would fit me or almost fit me. But I was overwhelmed. There was just so much to do and, and I didn't know how to get back to any sense of normalcy. There was a lot to do, but I, I didn't have the energy to do it. I went to a doctor and she gave me some sedatives. And I remember looking at that bottle on the table and, and just imagining taking too many of those pills. Just the, the peace of the grave actually appealed to me at that time. 
one day I was walking down Queens Boulevard, crying out to God and feeling very sorry for myself. And, and I came upon New Life Fellowship. And I remembered this is the church that I read about in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I decided I'm going to go back there on Sunday. And so I did. I went back on Sunday, and I just cried through the whole service. And I'm seeing Linda Johnson there, and she was the first person that reached out to me. <laughs> thank you, Linda. If I never thanked you publicly, boy, I appreciate you more than you know. Thank you. So I kept going back, and I kept crying. And I, and I realized that my healing journey through grief was beginning over at New Life. He was teaching me how to grieve well, how to be honest with him and with others and with myself. Up to that point, no matter what I was going through, I presented as strong and confident and having it together. I, I was the one who people came to with their problems, but now I was the one who needed help. And I had to humble myself and ask for it. I was a mess. And there was no pretending to be otherwise. God was stripping away my false self. Two years later, we moved back to the house in Long Island. I was still attending New Life. And I went through the EHS course a second time. God knew another layer was about to be peeled away. And I was being prepared for another season of grief. My father's health had started to fail. The man who had been my greatest support and, and the one who first told me about Jesus, he lived out his life with such a strong and a childlike faith. And he was declining more and more each day. I eventually became his main caregiver. And for over a year, my heart broke as I would hear him cry out for help and relief. And often it would be hours before any would come. Day after day, he deteriorated a little bit more until finally he was called home. And only two weeks after he passed away, I received a call from a caseworker with ATS. My niece's child was being removed from her home because of severe neglect. The caseworker asked if I would be willing to take her in to live with us until her mother was able to raise her. If not, she would be placed in foster care. My heart was sinking as I said yes. I knew this wasn't going to be a short-term commitment. I had hoped that after my father died, I'd be able to take some time to grieve and write and replenish and reconnect with friends. But all of our plans to move, to travel, to live a more simple life would be put on perpetual hold. We said yes, and within days, we were tripping over toys and changing diapers and bumping into walls for lack of sleep and scheduling appointments with caseworkers and social workers and lawyers and doctors. And strangers were coming into our homes and digging through our drawers and our refrigerator and our closets. And as the days went on, I found myself just filled with anger and resentment. I felt abandoned by God. Didn't he know how old and tired I was, how unfit I was for this job? During that time, I was invited to join Pete and Jerry and a small group of church leaders as they made their way through EHS in order to revise and refresh the course. I knew God was calling me to peel back yet another layer. As I went through the course again, the, emotion, the painful emotions came up and out. Fast forward to now. October 21, my life is still a mess. <laughs> a big, loud, chaotic, wonderful mess. On any given day, our house looks like a tornado ran through it. I'm a senior citizen with an aching back, raising a five-year-old. It's not the life I would have chosen, <laughs> but I believe it's the life God has given me. He's called me to, ministering not to counseling groups and university students, but ministering to one child, a child that God has used to bring new life to us to restore laughter and joy to our home. So like so many, we've all been through so many loss. I went through the loss of my home, the loss of my parents, the loss of my hopes and plan for the future, and I'm sure there'll be others. EHS teaches us that if we embrace our losses, God will use them to change us. I'm finally learning to embrace them, and he's changed me in ways I could never have imagined. He's enlarged my soul and my heart and my life. And I would just like to close with some words from Isaiah 61, and referring to our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, 
to bestow on them a crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Jerry, would you mind um, uh, just reading that, those verses again and slow? Uh, and I encourage you, uh, you can feel free to close your eyes if that's something that you're comfortable with or just receive these really beautiful words of the redemptive work of Christ. Could you just read that over us before we invite folks to share? Is that okay? Sure. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Let's just pause for a moment. Let that sink. Those are the words of Christ offering hope. Lord, we recognize your presence even now. May he replace your garment of despair into a garment of praise and joy. May he even do it now. Holy Spirit, your presence is sweet. When we invited Jerry to share this, she resisted. Uh, one of the conversations that you had with me, Jerry, is that I didn't want to be such a downer, she said. And even though that's not the word I would use, uh, I'll tell you why it's really significant for her to give that downer story. The reason why that's really significant is because if a person like Jerry, Jerry, if you're unable to enter into your own pain, what makes you think that you will be able to enter into the pain of others. I'll tell you what happens if you're unable to enter into your own pain. When you hear the pain of others, you will simply walk away. Or you will freeze because you don't know what to do. Or you will tell them to simply, hey, cheer up, move on. That's what happens when you're unable to enter into your own pain. However, like she shared, when she did begin to enter into her own pain, there was something beautiful that happened her heart, her soul began to expand. And you haven't seen the end of it because, because she's able to enter into that pain. When she comes across somebody else who's hurting, she will be such a healing presence. And this world needs people with that kind of healing presence. And so no, it's not a downer. It's actually quite redemptive, Jerry. And so thank you. Just like we did with um, Janique, uh, the mics are open again. Yeah, you could feel free to feel free to come up to the mic. Uh, you can get online if that's something that you'd like to do. We do ask that you keep your mask on as a way of observing these protocols. You don't need to adjust it, um, but you can lean in so that the folks on Zoom can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you so. Oh, is it on? Yeah. It's, yep, it's on. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it really. What I just said about just being able to enter into other people's pain. I remember when you were leading the women's Bible study and going through Psalms. And um, also the, the time that I was going through EHR, and I uncovered some things in my family of origin of abuse that really hit me hard. And I remember you prayed for me, and you were able to just speak to me. It was convenient at the time. 
So I just thank you so much for sharing your story. I mean, you've just been through. You've just been such um, just a person of light and has brought so much healing in the world of being so warm and loving. And so I'm just really appreciative of you leaning into that and sharing that with us because it just just makes so much sense. <laughs> and so thanks for sharing that and just being that presence in our lives. And I just thank you and love you. Go ahead, Jeannie. I'm just going to light this. You don't need to touch the stone. Here, I'm, I'm happy I didn't go last. Thank you. Um, this is a very young man who was like in his early 20s when he was um, a waitress at this really busy restaurant. Um, your work in me just moves me. And I'm inspired by your work. And I just appreciate you all. Because you could have said something else. Um, while you were sharing your story, I couldn't help but to think about like, and I feel like it's even <laughs> God is very consistent with me and my story. And you know, when you read that scripture when you talked about, you know, how He refers your flight to that on which He stands. Like that is your promise all through the Bible, and you had to just carry it with every breath, a manuscript ship in the way, because then you wouldn't even realize that you had. Amen. So true. Thank you, Janique. Angela and then Linda. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Linda, so good to see you. So Linda used to be part of staff of New Life in Elmhurst. So good to see you, Linda. Oh, Linda, and then Lin Linda and Linda. Whoa. Go, sorry. Go ahead. Right. Amen. 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 Receive it all, Jerry, Linda, and then Debbie. Hi, Jerry. Um, I'm also a recipient of your healing gifts. Um, I remember months and months ago when you were going around on this one prayer, and I was there in thought, and um, I just needed wisdom, and I just really felt like I was going through a lot. Um, but after sharing for a minute, I felt so so, so validated and so comforted by your prayer and your words to me. Um, and I need to just say that to all of you. True. Thank you. So true. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Your family is so, so amazing. <laughs> um, and as someone watching people in the church, Thank you so much for sharing. Um, thank you so much for um, not being 
Everybody, take a deep breath. Just take it in. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Donnie. Last one, and then we'll close our time. Good morning. Thank you for sharing. I was sitting in this pew when I saw your name. I, too, raised my kids. And uh, I was raised in Hillary Church, but never uh, was a substance abuser. And same story when we got saved here. My brother-in-law was actually nervous, so there was nobody else that could uh, take care of her. Now, we grew so attached to her, she was like my daughter. She still is. But the city ended up giving her back. No matter what we tried to do, uh, they wanted to give it back to the biological parents, which I can understand. But she, anyway, I'm not going to go into that and her story. One day I was walking through the park and I was angry. And I said, Lord, why did you? gives us this child we love so much, we care so much about, and just to have you taken away, that are taken away from us. And it was the seventh year that we had her. And the answer I got, it, it seemed cold at the time, but the answer was, I really don't care about your feelings. Hmm. I need you to put into her the love for me so she can live for me. It's not about your feelings. You're the vessel that I'm using to put the love of God in. So I was upset. Lord, you don't care about my feelings? How dare you? But I understood. God works in a way it, it's, it's so unlike Especially, we're so based on feelings. A lot of our, what we do is based on our feelings. We do things based on feelings. Even when we say that we try not to live by that, but he has a way. <laughs> you mentioned Noah to me, so I was also, uh, uh, I was also thinking about Noah as well. And Jonah. And it was actually just men ago. And he said, no, I'm going to go to that other nation. It's child shaping. I'm going to make you willing. <laughs> be willing. So that's what he does for us, no matter what our feelings are. You know, he makes us willing. And it took a time for me to receive that. And and hearing your story, I'm sorry, I'm not going on, but hearing your story, you know, I, I know that there's this great testimony that's going to grow from that. And, and what you put into your niece, uh, who knows what she, what, what, how she's going to serve the Lord. That's you know, right. Who knows? So, praise God. Thank you, guys. That's so true. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you, Jerry. Ronnie, do you mind? Can you come up, Ronnie, on the guitar? Is that cool? As we close, thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Why don't you stand with me as we, um, as we prepare to close? Again, thank you, Jerry, for just embodying what it means to do interior examination. Uh, one of the transformative values that we've touched on as we've gone through deeply formed life. Let me just tie in her story to the good news of the gospel. You see the sacrifice that she's putting in, and who does it benefit? It benefits this little girl, Delilah. Delilah is completely unaware of the kind of sacrifice that she's putting in. You are that Delilah. Christ has put in the ultimate sacrifice to the point of death. And it will take a lifetime for
for us to completely understand the depth and the breadth of the work of Jesus Christ. And yet, if you give your life to him, you are the beneficiary of that work. And so maybe if you're here today, you know what? You say to yourself, I, I haven't, I don't know that Jesus, I have not given my life to him. Today could be the day. And even as we, as we pray, you're simply invited to pray, Jesus, I receive you. And then speak to me afterwards, and we can talk about potential next steps. And so as we do at New Life, if you're comfortable doing this, uh, would you hold your hands in a posture of receiving with your palms facing up, if that's something that you're comfortable with, because we want to speak blessing and impart blessing to you in a time and an age where there could be so much hate. And so we want to do something countercultural and speak a blessing over you now. And so for all of you here, may God bless you. May God keep you. God's love demonstrated through the work of Jesus Christ. May he show his face and may he be gracious upon each of you in this room and every single person on Zoom hearing us now. That you might go in the hope of God, in the power of God, in the anointing of God. And we pray all these things through the name of our Savior, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Would you give him a hand? We clap unto you, Lord. Amen. Uh, Charles is not here because he's probably downstairs setting up. So just to give you a few um, you can be seated if you'd like. Um, that was nice, Ronnie. If you don't mind, keep playing, playing that. That was, give it up for Ronnie. Uh, another one, making sacrifices for the benefit of others. Thank you. Thank you. So just a, 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 few, a few things to keep in mind. Um, first of all, if you're, if you're new here, uh, welcome. If today was too heavy, don't worry. It's just once a month. If today was good, then you come back. So we are New Life East. It's a new church. We're a multiracial, multi-ethnic community, deeply transforming lives while experiencing deep transformation through Christ for the peace and prosperity of Nassau and beyond. After our gatherings, we have something called Chat and Chew, where you're invited to hang around downstairs. There's also going to be seating outside. Uh, folks bring their own grub to be able to eat and hang out. Uh, there is also going to be some light refreshments downstairs. However, just a few people are going to be handling out food just as a way of observing some protocols. Be reminded that this